Well, good morning, everyone, and I hope you're uh, hearing me well, wherever you happen to be, um, in this first virtual RAS community meeting 2020 that would, of course, have taken place at our usual National Astronomy Meeting, which for obvious reasons isn't happening this year. I'm Robert Massey, I'm Deputy Director of the Royal Astronomical Society. Uh, all I'm going to do for 20 seconds is just explain some of the housekeeping rules for this event. Uh, we have three speakers from the Science and Technology Facilities Council, Mark Thompson, the Chief Executive, the Chief Executive of the UK Space Agency, and Gunther Hassinger, one of the directors of the European Space Agency too. And the panel will be chaired by our president, uh, Professor Emma Bunce, who I'll bring in in just a second. But as panelists, what you'll be seeing, apart from the uh, title slide that you've got there, is and the slides that the speakers present and videos of them, you'll simply see a participant uh, channel and a Q&A box. Um, we're going to take all the questions through the Q&A box today, uh, so you won't be able to ask them orally because that's just not, not a feasible way to do it, given the number of participants we have. And uh, Lucinda Offer, who's also here, my education and outreach officer work, is, is managing a lot of this too, frankly putting it together extremely well. And we will see those questions, we will uh, moderate them, promote them, we'll try and avoid duplication, we'll bring them to the attention of the chair and so on as well. So that's how it's going to work this morning. You'll hear the, uh, the presentations, you're free at any time to type in the Q&A. Uh, we can also uh, perhaps answer some in writing, we can type answers if they're simple and something we can deal with as well. Um, but the panel will have those questions read out to them, mostly by Emma, possibly with Lucinda and I uh, chipping in with a few of them if we if we think there's something that uh, she's missed because there are too many questions being asked or something like that. So I don't think I'm going to talk any longer. You should. I just hope everybody's seeing it. Uh, if there are any issues that you you want to raise, you can also flag up issues, technical issues on the Q and A. Or uh, if you know my email address, rmassi at ras.ac.uk, I'll be keeping an eye on that too. And I understand also my colleague, uh, colleagues Kate and Gurji to monitoring our Twitter feed. And some people maybe want to ask uh, questions through that route as well. So uh, on that note, I will hand over to Emma and uh, mute myself and switch off my... I look yes. forward to uh, this session. So Emma. Thank you very much, Robert. Um, good morning, everybody, and a very well, warm welcome to the RES community session for 2020. Uh, I really hope that everyone is doing well. Um, and it's really great that we're able to reach out to so many people today through this virtual event. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Emma Bunce, and I've just taken over as the president of the Royal Astronomical Society. Um, as Robert's mentioned, we usually hold this community session uh, at the National Astronomy Meeting. Um, and of course, that meeting um, has had to be postponed for obvious reasons uh, until next year. Um, but today we're delighted that we're able to bring the community session to you via this online format, um, which we're all now quite familiar with. Uh, and I'm extremely grateful to our guests today uh, for joining us online um, to provide you with the latest information and plans um, from the Science and Technology Facilities Council, from the UK Space Agency, and from the European Space Agency. So you're probably aware that 2020 is also a very special year for us at the Royal Astronomical Society, uh, it being the 200 year anniversary of the society. Um, fortunately, we managed a, a special evening of celebration uh, back in January, um, but other planned events for this year have had to be moved to 2021. And while of course that is disappointing, uh, we will be looking forward to continuing the celebrations in 2021. Now, as well as celebrating, I think the bicentenary year provides us really with an opportunity to reflect on the RES and to think about what we currently provide for our fellows and for our community, and to consider how we might best adapt to the needs of that community uh, in the future. And I think this community session today is a fantastic example of what we can usefully do, um, facilitating engagement with funding bodies and with the space agencies and this communication is essential and provides a means for the community to get first-hand information um, from these bodies but also so that the top people who are joining us today get to hear direct from the community what is on people's minds. So I hope you take the opportunity to ask some questions today. Now, I mean, it's, it's pretty obvious really that here in the UK, this year has been full of, you know, unbelievable challenges so far. Um, and as well as being concerned about the pandemic itself, 
we're concerned about the longer term impact of COVID-19. Um, it's already impacted our work as a scientific community, both in terms of the progress of our projects, as particularly lab-based projects, the impact it has on our well-being as we work from home for months. I'm particularly concerned for PhD students and for early career scientists who've lost opportunities to progress their studies, uh, to network and present their work at conferences and more. And then, of course, there's some emerging evidence that there is disparity in productivity during this time for particularly women with children during lockdown. Um, and there was a publication in Nature just over a week or so ago about this. And of course, beyond COVID-19, the impact of Brexit is still of great concern to us. Um, it's been rather more quiet on that front in the news of late, for obvious reasons again. Um, but it remains a very relevant current issue for us all as scientists. So again, um, I'm sure these are the sorts of issues that will be on people's minds amongst other things today. So please ask questions. Okay, so thanks very much again to our guests for joining us this morning. Um, and we're going to kick off with a presentation from Professor Mark Thompson, who is the Executive Chair of the Science and Technology Facilities Council. Mark, many thanks for being here this morning. Um, and I'm going to hand over to you now. Thanks, Emma. Okay, so I'm gonna give a brief update on uh, the world as seen from STFC. So I'll cover broad topics and then of course focus on our astronomy program at the end. Um, I thought it was worth just, just letting people put people in the picture of what we've done in response to COVID-19. Um, and I think the first thing to emphasize, ST STFC is an incredibly large and complex organization. We have obviously our own research sites, so such as Harwell, Darsbury, uh, UK Astronomy Technology Center. We have many staff, 2,400 staff, most of them are scientists, technicians, um, and engineers. We also, at our campuses, host a number of companies, over 100 companies. We have 1,300 tenants, and we have a number of joint ventures, such as Diamond Light Source uh, and, and so forth. So very, very complex. Um, so our planning for COVID-19, we've actually we, we, we tried, tried to do this as bottoms up as possible. So we have 21 departments in STFC level, and we try, try and understand impact at local, local level. And then, of course, we have to coordinate with all of our, all of our partners. So we actually, in fact, before um, the, the pandemic emerged, we, we, we actually established um, a business continuity plan for, for, for COVID-19, or what became COVID-19. Um, and our, our health and safety team actually flagged the risk back up in January. So we actually started our planning very, very early. And this has really, really served us very well. So we established contingency planning and internally, we set these five, five alert levels again very, very early on before, before the pandemic really, uh, re really established itself. Um, basically going from business as, as usual to everything shut at level five. Um, so on the 23rd of March, uh, immediately, and it was immediately following the Prime Minister's announcement, we, we basically suspended our activities at our sites. So what, what did that mean in practice? It doesn't actually mean that we closed our sites. So the sites were still open for, well, for COVID-19 research, uh, but also for critical health and safety and critical maintenance work. I'm not gonna go through everything um, on this slide, but this is kind of the kind of stuff that STFC was doing um, in the, the April, kind of May timescale. Uh, just a few highlights here. So there was a lot of research going on, so I could highlight uh, a couple of activities at Diamond Light Source. So Diamond has been really at the forefront of um, the structural biological analysis of, of, the, of the virus, um, and actually then looking at uh, possibilities of repurposing drugs uh, to, to, uh, to address, to, to address the, uh, the mechanisms that the virus attacks cells. We also had several projects at the central, central laser facility, and some of these were set up as remote access pro projects. Um, basically looking at treatment for, for acute respiratory uh, distress syndrome. Um, our scientific computing um, department uh, and, uh, and also the Hartree Centre basically focused, focused a lot of their resources on uh, providing support for the, the work at Diamond and elsewhere, but also, but also actually uh, pandemic modelling and also the, the, uh, the folding at home project. 
I think it's just worth also noticing that we have tenants. So these, these are our companies. So one, one, of the, one of our tenants, Oxford Nanopore, a very, very large uh, uh, kind of co company, um, actually was making devices, a large number of de devices for rapid sequencing of COVID-19. And these have been adopted around the world. And again, what we do as STFC is provide them uh, state-of-the-art clean room facilities. And the other thing I just want to highlight at the bottom of the screen here is of course our staff um, reacted incredibly well actually and, and really engaged in a number of support activities so there's the ventilator challenge uk uh, we donated very early on a significant number of items to local local um, healthcare the healthcare sector and of course uh, our, our various technology teams produce visors sanitizers etc i just wanted to highlight the work of our staff on the ventilator challenge so we had about 70 staff uh, primarily at the rutherford appleton laboratory actually working on the Ventilator UK challenge. Uh, they were providing uh, training roles, testing and logistics for this consortium that actually delivered uh, 11,000 ventilators to the NHS in a really very, very short time scale. The reason we were actually able to engage so strongly on this is the, the company, the prime company um, that this work was focused on was Penlong, which happens to be in Abingdon, uh, just seven miles down the road from, from, uh, from the Rutherford Appleton lab. So, so it's really, you know, I, I have to always kind of publicly thank all of our staff for being so positively uh, engaged in, in this work, a really big, really big effort. So that's kind of what we did. Um, of course, we've also been planning for getting back to work. So, um, so as I say, we moved to this alert level four pretty rapidly, and we are now actually at alert level three, which is work, work from home where possible, but we are now phasing in a return, a return of laboratory-based staff. The way we did this, we ran a number, a number of pilot projects at our national labs just to understand what working under these uh, conditions is like. And that really helped us. And uh, just over a month ago, we, we opened up our RAL and uh, um, UK ATC in Edinburgh sites. They moved to level three and then a couple of days later, Darsbury. So what we're doing at the moment, uh, this, 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 this kind of cartoon on the bottom is really just saying we're, we're gradually phasing up um, staff occupancy across our, our sites. The, the aim is to rise to 1,200, that's about 30% capacity by September. Um, so the arrow kind of indicates where we are. So it's a gradual process, but we are actually opening up all of our, uh, all of our sites for, for you know, critical laboratory-based work that can't be done from home. So that's been, it's been an interesting journey. And I think, I think we're in you know, say quite, a, quite, a, quite a positive place at the moment where we're seeing a lot of activity restarting. Just on the UKRI level, of course, um, you're all aware that um, Otteline Laser took over as uh, a new CEO. Um, so she's uh, previously was Professor of Plant Development and, and Director of the Sainsbury Laboratory at the University of Cambridge. Um, a great um, champion for equality and diversity in science. Uh, very, very positive outlook, I think. Um, so I, I've had a number of meetings with Otteline. Uh, I'm actually a really, really, really good thing. Worth, worth noticing, noting also, also we've, we've got a new chief financial officer, quite an important position, obviously, at UKRI, and that's Siobhan uh, Peters. The other thing to highlight on a broader, broader picture that you, again, you're probably aware of this, the, the UK government uh, published its um, R&D roadmap a couple of weeks back. Uh, very ambitious, very forward looking, uh, re really, really reaffirming the commitment to a very large increase in uh, funding for uh, research and development um, over the coming years. So very, very positive. And of course, UKRA is formulating um, its response. Uh, it's very good, actually, that many of the themes in the R&D roadmap actually kind of map onto um, STFC's kind of strategic goals. So there are a number of these topics here. One of them is around uh, people, basically people in team, talented people in teams, skills effectively, um, driving up innovation and productivity, uh, the so-called levelling up of R&D across the UK, so really really ensuring that the R&D activities are spread uh, geographically around the UK. Um, quite a big focus actually in the R&D roadmap around developing world-leading world, world -leading infrastructure and institutions, again that was a very welcome news I think from the SDFC perspective, and also being at the forefront of global collaboration, which of course, from an STFC perspective, pretty much everything we do is, is international. So again, I just want to emphasize, I think, I think this, this, this document um, was, was really, really very, very positive and covered, covers a number of areas. Of course, the real, the real work is happening now and actually responding to that and how, how we're, we're gonna implement some of those, those activities. The other thing I just wanted to 
uh, just note very, very briefly is uh, I'd, I'd say how, how high equality, diversity and inclusion is on the UKRI agenda and also on the STFC agenda. Uh, one of our kind of, if you like, uh, we have we have enablers of excellence that we've implemented across the organisation, and this top bullet point really is our headline that we're going to value our people and champion EDI across all of our activities, and we're absolutely committed committed to that. Um, the other thing I think is worth highlighting that UKRI put out a uh, very positive um, statement on Black Lives Matter. And this was signed up by all of the executive chairs of the uh, the councils of UKRI. Um, and I have to say, this this I thought this, this statement was, I say, very positive. It was not a it was not a passive statement. Really, it is a commitment to action. So I'm was really very very pleased to pleased to see that. I think it's just worth noticing as well. I mean, of course, EGNI is something that, that you know, I, I absolutely believe in. It's, it's absolutely necessary for the success of an organisation. I think it's just worth noting, um, whilst in some areas I think STFC still has more to do, if you look at our council, 42% um, are female, and actually we at the, at the moment 25% are BAME as well. So we, you know, we are, we are, uh, let's say, talking, we're not just talking about equality, diversity, inclusion, we really are, we are ensuring it's embedded across our organisation. Uh, and that, that's going to be a factor in all future recruitment rounds. There's also just take take notice take note of the, the this is the UKRI um, initiative. It's the Take Pride in Research and Innovation campaign. I think if you if I hope if, if this works, if you click on that link, it'll actually take you take you somewhere when the slides are circulated. Right, a few words about funding update. Everybody's obviously interesting in where we are. And I, th I thought it was worth starting to saying something about the impact of COVID nineteen. Um, over the last months, we've been uh, working through our financial modelling. Uh, lots of uncertainties, of course just looking at our internal STFC budget. Uh, basically, it's a story of swings and roundabouts. Um, so largely for our FY 2021 budget, we, we think it's largely manageable. There are some, some things where we spend more slowly and some things where we, we effectively are not as effective as, as uh, usual, uh, but it's largely manageable. Um, the impact really is there are, there are clearly going to be some downstream delays in projects. Uh, now, of course, um, we also recognise coronavirus is going to have a significant, at least medium-term impact on the research community. Uh, a very kind of very long-term, long long-term long impact is, is kind of uncertain. Um, but what I'd like to assure you is that we, we, our program management uh, of the, for example, the astronomy program and the particle physics program, and so forth. I would say it continues almost as usual, a little a little bit slower. Um, but we're, we're, I think our team is working very effectively from home. Now, of course, we're following the UKRI wide grants guidance, and this is being updated regularly, and I'll say a few words about that um, in a moment. And again, we, we are continuing to stay in, in very frequent contact with university colleagues. So again, if anybody out there has questions, concerns about specifically about grants, please, please don't hesitate to contact the relevant program manager. Now, of course, we're not just looking at the short term, we're also looking at the long term financial planning. So that planning is underway, uh, still, still many uncertainties. Now, I think UKRI have responded, of course, to some of the concerns. I think Emma um, noted, noted, I think the concerns that many of us had really is the, the impact on uh, young, young researchers. Uh, so PhD students and uh, I'd say early, early career um, research associates. Um, so UKRI have put in place a number of mitigations. So back in April, it was announced uh, that uh, final year doctoral students uh, whose studies would have been disrupted would be funded funded for an extension of up to six months. So this implementation is being carried out. I won't go into the details here, they're all on the UKRI website. Um, again, the intention is to review, to come back in August, September time, timescale, actually understand the effectiveness of this, this policy and also the costs. Um, and that, that will really inform uh, on, ongoing implementation and future policy. But I, I'm really pleased to say, see that, you know, across UKRI, we, we're able to respond very rapidly. And again, I'm, I'm sure you're all aware, but in June was an announcement of a significant amount of money really to, 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 to help mitigate some of the effects uh, on, particularly on, on grants. Um, so this is deploying something like 180 million of funding, uh, again, to sustain that grant funded research. Uh, so again, that's in addition, there's, there's obviously a permitted uh, change in use for existing grant funding, that's, that's, that's there. There's also some flexibility um, up to of up to 80, 80 million to 
uh, redistribute any grant on underspends due to these, this COVID-19 disruption. So these are significant and obviously uh, rather costly, uh, costly interventions, but the, uh, but the intention here really is to mitigate the, as, as far as possible, the, the, the short-term impacts of COVID-19. Uh, I think this is very positive news, I have to say, about fellowships. So the UKRI Future Leader Fellowships, um, the tagline is there, grow a strong supply of talented individuals, uh, vibrant research and innovation in the UK. So in the last round, 10 were awarded in STFC's general area of remit. Um, so that actually makes 23 FLFs over three rounds. So that's actually a pretty high success rate. Um, so I, I know certainly at, at previous RAS meetings, there were some concerns expressed that actually, you know, maybe, maybe our field, uh, so astronomy, particle physics would not do so well um, in attracting uh, or getting awards for future leader fellowships. So that, that clearly has not been the case. Um, our young scientists have been incredibly successful, so that's great news. Um, also, just to note that, that um, the STFC Ernest Rutherford Fellowships, um, so these are kind of similar, similar um, kind of level to the FLFs. Uh, last round, we had 173 applicants and awarded 10 fellowships. And also, there are the EPSRC STFC Stephen Hawking Fellowships, which are, again, for research around areas, particular areas of interest of um, uh, Stephen Hawking. Um, so 10 fellowships were awarded in the, the first round. So if you look at this across the board, that's 43 fellowships. Um, and that would compare, compares typically to the S previously STFC's fellowships, which were roughly 12, 12 per year. So this is really a very significant uplift lift in the number of fellowships available for research in our, our science areas. So this is very, very positive, positive news. So these are the open and for, forthcoming fellowship uh, 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 um, calls. There's one around research software engineers. This is joint with EPSRC. So this is really recognizing the importance that uh, high quality research software, the absolutely essential value for high, high quality research software for, for a lot of what we do and actually really recognizing, recognizing the importance of those activities. Uh, the next round of Ernest Rutherford fellowships, the closing date is 17th of September. Uh, the next round of Stephen Hawking fellowships, again, this is joint with EPSRC, um, that, that, that is imminent. Uh, I think the exact, exact timeline is still open to question, but it's, you know, it's something, something like likely to open in September and close November. And again, uh, the next round of UK future leadership fellowships um, is, is, is expected later this year. Um, again, I say expected because obviously there's been a bit of disruption um, recently, but we're expecting that, that, that round to close in 2020, January 2021. Now, what you can see here is many, many opportunities. <clears throat> and I think that, that actually raises, for me, raises the question about the balance, balance between these, these schemes. And our, the STFC position really has been we were, we were going to look and see how these schemes bed, bed in before, before thinking about how we might do things differently in the future. But that question may well come up uh, through our advisory panels uh, sometime, sometime shortly. Few words about the infrastructure roadmap. Um, so we put out the this is a UKRI document. <coughs> uh, this was really the menu, I would say, the menu of options for the infrastructure roadmap um, that was published in November. Um, something like two, 250 options were identified. We've now established an in infrastructure advisory committee uh, to advise UKRI on long, its long-term strategic view for an infrastructure portfolio. Um, and the councils of UKRI have submitted proposals for full, full, full proposals, shovel-ready activities and preparatory activities. Uh, and, and STFC's priorities really were flowed up from our advisory committee, science board and, and, and councils. So the IAC review meeting uh, for this first, first step towards developing an infrastructure roadmap, real, real roadmap portfolio, that will take place in November uh, 2020. And that committee will then advise UKRI executive committee and board on investment uh, priorities. Right, finally, just a few words on the astronomy programme, a uh, lot going on. So first, just on ESO. Um, now, currently, ESO and the, the ALMA facilities are closed, but that doesn't mean work has stopped. Huge amount of work on ELT, the site uh, preparation. So the uh, photograph below gives you, gives you a picture of the uh, the vast foundations of the ELT, so there's a lot of work going on on the entrance, earthquake protection, power plant, etc. Um, 
The work on the instruments is pro pro progressing extremely well, actually, in the UK. So it's not just on harmony, but it's also on, uh, just for example, on the UK ATC support uh, to the Dutch-led uh, Metis instrument that, that passed its design review recently. This next, uh, this next point is quite an important one. So um, there's been a review of the ELT costing. Uh, so this is the cost to completion, and that's identified the need for a cost increase of roughly 10%, really to cover, the, to ensure there's enough uh, project contingency to guarantee the project can be implemented. So that's a, a challenge. Um, a cost increase of 10% um, is not comfortable, but it, it's also not a vast cost increase. Uh, so the member states, including the UK, um, are being asked to find their share of this, and we're, we're actively talking to UKRI and BASE about how to find the, the additional UK contribution. So as I say, 10% it's, it's, is, is not a vast number, but it's just a, an issue we need to, to resolve. Uh, lots going on with the square kilometre array, so just some recent highlights. Um, we are a long way now down, down the road to establishing the square kilometre array intergovernmental organisation. Um, We're hoping that will be the treaty will be ratified in quarter four 2020, so the end of this year, uh, enabling the first council meeting to happen either at the end of this year or, or I would actually expect um, January 2021. And then the construction, the, the official construction to, to start later in 2021. So it's been a long, long road to getting here, um, but actually thing, things have moved very, very positively over the last uh, couple, couple of years. The second bullet point really emphasised that the, the, um, the system critical design review, the, the overall system design review was completed in April. Everything's closed off now. So the review, essentially all of the design reviews are being gone through. There are a few loose ends, but very, very few. Um, now, the members are working um, with, with uh, respective governments to ensure that we have the full funding for the full scope, scope of SKA1. Um, and just to say on the UK side, we have a business case that has been written, uh, developed and written to increase our commitment by 92 million, and we will be seeking approval for that. Um, and, and other countries are doing the, uh, the, the, going along a similar, similar route. Just worth, just worth noting, noting um, EPFL um, in uh, Lausanne, uh, Switzerland, it, 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 uh, recently became SKA's 14th member. So there's a lot of interest, uh, continued interest in the project. So lots of good news around S SKA. Uh, further good news, um, uh, the, the, the weave instrument at the William Herschel telescope. Um, so the assembly here is making uh, good, good progress. So the work's proceeding um, in La Palma, actually aligning the weave focal uh, translation unit um, and actually taking delivery of the correction. There are a few pictures there and as you can see uh, people taking all, all necessary uh, COVID-19 precautions so work work still continues uh, at, at, at the ING. But, but, so this is a, a, big, a big big milestone for Weave. Uh, obviously COVID-19 has led to some, some delays but actually work is continuing uh, and uh, we're, we're, we're optimistic that this, this project will be be delivered later later this year. Now again, um, everybody everybody on the on the call is very well aware of Solar, Solar Orbiter. Uh, Solar Orbiter is kind of a project. It's kind of close to my heart because I was uh, on the chairing the PPRP and deputy chair of the PPRP when Solar Orbiter first was doing its round around the UK. Um, so it's actually great to see uh, first first data from Solar Orbiter. Obviously, the mission is well on its way for the rendezvous, rendezvous with its uh, cl close, close rendezvous with the sun. Uh, the SPICE instruments uh, saw first light in April. The uh, first, first image was released in July. Um, the uh, Plasma Analyze SWA was commissioned. Uh, again, a big, uh, big UK uh, contribution there. That was done from home using, uh, during COVID lockdown. Anyway, this is clearly a very, very exciting project, huge potential for understanding uh, the, up close the dynamics of our nearest star. And I, th I think the, the, this wonderful image that was, uh, I think it was released last week, uh, just you know, super, super, super high detail of the, uh, the surface of the sun. Very, very, very impressive. And again, we're working closely with the UK Space Agency, obviously, and, uh, and, and ESA. Another, another highlight, I think, is the go-to project, the Gravitational Wave Optical Transient uh, observatory. So again, this is up um, in La Palma uh, at the uh, Rock de, de los Muchachos Observatory. Um, so we've recently awarded um, 3.4 million to the University of Warwick to expand the network of these telescopes. Um, 
So I think this is a really, you know, really, really exciting, exciting project. Um, also going to support um, funding uh, a second site um, in Australia, in the Southern Hemisphere. Uh, so this really means the additional sky coverage means this consortium will be able to cover the entire uh, visible sky every every two to three days. So, so potentially uh, very exciting in the light of uh, the kind of ongoing uh, discoveries uh, with gravitational waves. Finally, just to say something about grants, the 2020 grant round uh, is, is, is ongoing. Um, the panel meetings are going to be held virtually in September, uh, followed by the usual merger meeting uh, and, and report to the Space Agency SPAC and also our, the SDFC Science Board in October. To give you some sense, uh, the 2020 round, 256 projects came in um, in 48 separate proposals. As always, there are new applicants. This time around, there were 11 new applicants and three new, new groups applying for uh, the consolidated uh, grant. So again, um, the AGP chairs are considering options for ensuring how the proposals get, a, uh, get their peer review as always, uh, and basically how the panel can work optimally in the current circumstances and always without, as always without bias. Uh, funding um, in this round is, is, is likely to continue to be, be flat. Um, and uh, the last point is quite an important one. We had a review of the consolidated grant um, and uh, the, there was an implementation plan. So the, uh, th this was chaired by um, Jim Wild. They've met on a couple of occasions and they're recommending a scheme which could allow both large awards, basically akin to the consolidated grants and more, more, sing, uh, more standard grants, single PA, P, PI type, type grants. So anyway, our, 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 yeah, the community is very heavily involved in how we can best implement uh, the consolidated grants. Finally, just a few words on strategy, a um, number of highlights. So STFC is leading on the development of the European Science Vision and Infrastructure Roadmap through, through AstroNet. Uh, panels are being set up and, uh, and, and they're working. Drafts are expected um, in a few months' time. There will be a significant community consultation um, in, in late autumn. For UKRI, STFC is leading on um, so a so-called UKRI Space Deep Dive really to try and capture all of the activities across UKRI on space science. Um, and, and, and again, STFC is also there providing advice on space science and how that might feed into the new uh, National Space Council. Uh, and finally, I think an important point um, in this rapidly evolving kind of a situation, and, and, and actually science, you know, science is evolving very, very rapidly, um, our advisory panels are looking to refresh their, their internal strategies and then report them back to Science Board. So a vast amount going on, uh, challenges and opportunities. So here, here are the big challenges. Uh, we are still in flat cash. Um, this is an inflationary increase. So it's kind of not a, not a uh, not, we're not being nibbled away by inflation this year, but it is flat cash still. Um, and this just challenges everything we do, challenges our exploitation grants. Um, now we are looking looking um, to secure additional core funding in a comprehensive spending review, um, which is expected later this year. Um, now the, the the issue here, I think, is the the, the lack of um, let's say free free energy and the resources uh, that we have makes it very difficult to be agile with funding. Um, so it's really really important that the advisory panels inform STFC of new opportunities and these new opportunities are flagged in, in, in various roadmaps. Another challenge is EU, EU exit. I, I, it seems to have been, well, it hasn't been forgotten at all actually, but uh, it's take, taken the back seat over the last few months. Um, but so obviously it's a key issue. Um, we, you know, we, need, we need to ensure that the UK remains a key global player and a key player in Europe, um, however, that, however that happens. Uh, another thing, another challenge I think it's worth noticing is just the, uh, the growth of satellite constellations. Uh, so the potential of, um, particularly for astronomy, obviously, the, the potential impact of tens of thousands of uh, low, low, low um, orbit um, satellites through the Starlink and OneWeb um, constellations. So there is potential impact both on radio and optical astronomy. So there's, there's, there's a flag there and we just have to uh, be sure we, we keep on top of that and understand what mitigations are, are necessary. The final point is one I, one I, I think is a real challenge is in, in this flat cash environment is actually providing funding uh, to ensure the, the very early stage technology development actually happens uh, that we can then propagate through our, our future projects. 
The final slide really, my, my outlook, uh, this is the positive outlook actually. Uh, firstly, the, the government continues to positively promote, promote a major uplift in R&D funding. Uh, publication of the R&D roadmap two weeks ago, not last week actually. Um, the spending review is coming. Um, this will be an opportunity to seek for an uplift in the fundamental, uh, in fundamental research, the so-called core programme. This need is recognised across UKRI, so I think uh, there is an opportunity uh, in the coming spending round to really address the, address the negative impact of a number of years of flat cash. No, no guarantees, but there is the appetite to do that. Um, obviously, new ways of working. We, we, we kind of know the post-COVID world is not going to look exactly the same as the pre-COVID world. world. Uh, we, we are obviously thinking about the implications on, of, on our programme. It's unclear, um, both for our core programme and our national facilities. Uh, but from my perspective, it's important just to look for the opportunities in this, this uncertainty. Uh, and there clearly are opportunities. And um, I, think, I think this meeting, the fact that uh, we probably have two and a half times the, the, the usual number of people at the town meeting on this uh, online webinar, webinar really kind of, uh, I think, indicates that, uh, that not, obviously not moving to an entirely webinar-based future, but actually these types of webinars will, will play a role in, in the future, whatever, whatever happens, I think. So clearly, just finally, we, you know, it's clearly we, we, we are in uncertain times, but, but I actually think there are very many reasons to be positive. And I hope those, 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 those list of a few items there gives you a sense of why, why I um, believe, believe there are good, good reasons to be positive. So on that note, I shall uh, finish and probably hand back to Emma. Mark, thank you. Thank you so much for that very informative um, presentation. Um, we've got a couple of minutes. So I think what I'm going to do is take a couple of the perhaps relatively quick questions for you now. And then what we'll do, we've got some good, really great questions coming in. We'll save some of those for the panel later on, um, which could be answered more broadly as well. So the first question I'm just going to read out is, will the UKRI Future Leaders Fellowship Scheme continue after round six? Yeah, I, I, can't, don't, I don't know the answer to that. Well, I, I don't think there is an answer to that question at the moment. I mean, UKRI is look at, looking at its um, strategy for talent as a whole. Um, I, I would be surprised if, if a fellowship programme along the lines of Future Leader Fellowships wasn't part of that programme. But I can't give you a, a definitive answer on that, but I'd be very surprised if they didn't continue or okay. something very, very similar. Okay, that's great. Thank you. And then um, a second question to do with fellowships, again, um, saying that the various fellowship schemes are mostly aimed at people who are already leaders. We don't currently have a more junior fellowship scheme. Uh, we used to, but that was that was stopped. So will the review of fellowship schemes you mentioned consider a scheme to bridge the gap between yeah. finishing PhDs and becoming that world leader? Yeah, I think I think this is a, re a really good a really good question. Um, and as I say, I, th I think if we get to a situation where we, we understand the future leader fellowships are, are you know a stable a stable route to that senior fellow you know that senior level fellowships, then I think one of the questions we can ask ourselves is: Do we rebrand the Ernest Rutherford fellowships, or reduce the number and and, and um, implement a, a kind of a you know post post PhD uh, fellowship scheme or earlier earlier fellowship scheme. So I think it's a good question, and that's one we will we will need to consult with the community. I think our nervous, nervousness over that initially was um, just just letting the current current uh, UK railway fellowship schemes bed in, and we had we have discussed this at our council uh, with, with with council as well. So I think it's a really I think it's a really good point. So um, it's certainly one I'm uh, in, you know interested in actively uh, actively pursuing that discussion anyway. Thank you. Um, I'm just going to add in a very quick point that I was that I noted as you spoke. You spoke about the support that's been provided for PhD students um, during this crisis, particularly final year students. Um, has STFC been uh, in conversation with those fellowship holders um, to ensure that any delay that they might be facing due to the current crisis can be supported uh, beyond their their grant term perhaps the phds or the fellowships or the fellows yeah um i mean we are looking to do what we can i, I mean I'd, I'd have to actually talk to our programs okay. programs and we, we always we, we always just encourage people to talk talk to talk to the relevant people in our programs and we you know we, we will try and be as flexible as we possibly can uh, but of course the, these these extensions 
there, there are very, very large amounts of money involved. Um, and I'm very, I'm just, I'm very, you know, I'm very pleased that UKRI has been able to, to, to take action because it was clearly a really important issue. But we have to go, again, we have to look at how this plans, are, plans out long term. Yeah, that's, that's great, Mark. Thank you very much for now. And I'll, I'll see you again later on the panel. Um, OK, so we're going to move on now. Um, we're going to be hearing now from Professor Gunther Hassinger, uh, Director of Science from the European Space Agency. Uh, Gunther, thank you for taking the time to be with us today. Uh, we very much appreciate that. So I'm going to hand over to you now uh, for your presentation. Thank you very much, uh, Emma. Um, and thank you to the Royal Astronomy Society for inviting me um, for this uh, review. And I would like to give you uh, some of the highlights of the ESA scientific program, uh, focusing on the most recent uh, developments. Um, so you know that within ESA, we have actually solar system missions, we have astronomy missions, um, we have these charts which are summarizing the various missions. Uh, typically, we have in each of these charts the legacy missions which we are building our experience on. We have the missions which are currently in orbit and active, and I will actually focus on two uh, today, a solar orbiter and Bepi Colombo. And then we have this line of future missions, which are, which we are currently preparing with a lot of excitement. Um, and I will come to that um, also addressing some of the questions uh, about the status, for instance, of uh, future missions. Let's start with solar orbit. T minus 10 seconds, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. And lift off of our solar orbit and international collaboration to give us new images and a better understanding of our life-giving star. You know, every one of these launches is really fascinating. Uh, when you start to feel the atmosphere shaking, you don't even hear the rocket. You really feel it in your chest. But this one was particularly beautiful because uh, it was uh, during full, mu full moon and we were originally thinking that the rocket would go to the moon, but then it rightly made its uh, turn uh, going into the sun. And um, uh, as Mark has mentioned, we have actually had the luxury to show the first pictures uh, of the first light um, press release uh, last uh, uh, July in 16th. And, um, uh, I, I saw the pictures myself for the first time at that moment as well, I can tell you, and it was really flabbergasting. And so let me just lead you through uh, one of these fascinating videos that uh, the extreme ultraviolet imager has made. And in the first light image, we already basically have identified new phenomena, uh, which are called the campfires here. So you see these very, very small, tiny uh, uh, effects down here, you see the size of the Earth. So each of these campfires is probably of the size of a European country, but you even have some individual pixels that are lighting up um, uh, continuously. And it is really fascinating to see such a great um, uh, promise for the future. This is the quiet sun. So imagine what will happen when the sun is getting uh, more active. Now, solar orbiter, you know, has 10 instruments and they are all working together like an orchestra um, and this is a nice example here where you basically get the full disk image from the extreme ultraviolet imager. Then you get the spectral imaging of a subsection here. And when you then look at the spectrum of a particular hotspot, you can identify the individual atoms that are shining and radiating there. And simultaneously, the in situ measurements, um, uh, the in situ instruments are measuring the plasma that comes out of these uh, regions. And this is a beautiful spectrum from the solar wind analyzer, where you have all the different elements here, like hydrogen, helium, carbon, and so on, uh, oxygen. And you see the individual energy of the individual particles. Um, so all of this is a big grand um, symphony of phenomena on the sun. Now, uh, this is not the only element of the symphony because we also have other spacecrafts in the same environment. We have cluster. We have Bepi Colombo, and the next thing I will mention is the flyby of Bepi Colombo uh, during Easter time in the middle of the COVID crisis. We were actually lucky to be able to switch on all of the solar system instruments, and so we have now wonderful simultaneous measurements uh, of the magnetic field and the particles um, from 
Epicolombo cluster and solar orbiter. And since cluster is already quite um, aged and quite uh, seasoned and experienced, uh, we can use cluster as a full calibration tool for both for Pepe and solar orbiter. And so now uh, let me come to Pepe Colombo. Uh, that was an almost as beautiful night launch uh, just uh, already two years ago. Um, and uh, Pepe Colombo was passing by the Earth on 10th of April on Good Friday. Uh, Bepi Colombo, you know, is on its way to the inner solar system, to Mercury, and it has to go by several flybys. The first one was happening on Earth, uh, the next one will be happening at Venus, um, and then several ones um, around Mercury before it finally settles into the orbit of Mercury. So we are playing billiard with the planets, and um, this happened, as I said, during the COVID crisis period, to, to where all of us were kind of locked down here. We were looking up onto Pepe Colombo that was looking down on us. And so I would like to show you a little video sequence uh, that comes from Pepe Colombo directly. Simultaneously, we also measured um, with the instruments on board, and I just want to give you an example of a magnetic field measurement where Bepi comes in, you hear the sound of the magnetic field, and then when Bepi enters the magnetosphere, it all, all of a sudden becomes very quiet. Uh, and so during that period, we were able to measure field, particles, everything together. And we will do something very similar with Venus uh, soon. And um, so this is really giving a foreshadow of the exciting science that will come once we arrive at Mercury. And we have also um, issued a, a um, competition about the nicest ground-based images passing by. Uh, here you just have seen the little dot of Pepe Colombo and now it's vanished. The reason for it being vanished is that that was the first time when Bepi actually entered the shadow of the Earth, so the solar panels did not receive power anymore. We were a little bit worried that it got too cold at that time, but everything worked fine. And now here it is back. Um, and we had, as I said, this competition of several ground-based uh, amateur astronomer images um, passing um, Bepi by. Now let me come to some more excitement. Um, Comments are currently uh, quite uh, in our mind. Um, and there was one fascinating um, phenomenon that we didn't foresee, but that still happened. There is this comet Atlas that originally promised to become a very bright, nice comet. But then in April, uh, it basically uh, this, uh, entangled it into 23, 25 uh, different um, pieces. And we thought originally that is the end of the comet. But then two of these pieces actually survived and uh, continued a little bit. And that was around the time when it was realized that actually a solar orbiter would serendipitously fly through the tails of that comet. Um, uh, unfortunately, by the time solar orbiter flew through the tail by the end of May and early June, the comet has been dissolved completely. But we are still looking for traces of cometary material in the magnetic field and in the particles. Uh, the data from solar orbit that takes quite a while to come down and to be analyzed, but um, this is another kind of serendipitous um, science. Um, so there were several other interesting comets that became dudes, uh, but finally we have a beautiful comet that you can see now every evening uh, with the binocular, um, the, the comet Neowise. And so this is this just shows that the cometary science is, is really um, still very um, uh, exciting. And this is actually justifying why we have uh, selected a specific mission uh, last year to fly to a comet, to a comet that is as yet unknown. So we will actually launch uh, so, uh, um, Comet Interceptor together with the Ariel uh, spacecraft uh, in around 2028. It will then be parked um, around the uh, Lagrange point uh, close to the Earth, and then it will wait until a new comet will be discovered, a comet that has never visited the solar system before. So it is a fresh um, young object. 
And if we are lucky, it could even be an interstellar visitor. Uh, we have now in the meantime seen two interstellar visitors. And so this is an extremely exciting piece um, of the nearby uh, universe. But this is a Royal Astronomical Society. So we would like to do astronomy. And that brings me to the cosmic observers, to the similar chart of our missions that are um, studying the universe. Again, we are standing on the shoulders of giants of a large number of legacy missions. But currently we have five astronomy missions um, in orbit. And we have actually one newcomer on the block, Cheops, that has been launched in December. And I will give you a little bit of um, a preview. And here we have the slew of missions that we are currently preparing. And actually these years are extremely exciting because um, we will launch James Webb in 21. Uh, it has now been moved from March 21 to October 21, but it is still 21. Uh, we are preparing um, Euclid to be launched in 22 in the same year as JUICE. Um, and there are several other missions. So these years are extremely exciting and dense for, for the European Space Agency. But then for the future, we are preparing very exciting missions that I will come to um, towards the end of my talk. So let me give you a few highlights from the astronomy missions. This is the first light of Cheops. And it turned out that it is actually, I mean, it's a defocused image, therefore it looks a bit ugly, but the um, point spread function is much more benign than people have um, anticipated. And that means that the transit life cur light curves from Cheops are actually much smoother than originally anticipated. And so we can accurate, more accurately determine um, uh, the light curves. The disadvantage is that it is spread out over a larger number of pixels. So we are losing a little bit at the faint end, but we are gaining quality at the brighter uh, end of the system. Um, and then we had in the last few months, uh, the very exciting uh, anniversary of the Hubble Space Telescope, our real um, working horse hero. And this is a beautiful picture of two star forming regions in the Large Magellanic Cloud. Uh, our 30th anniversary image. And I would like to show you another recent highlight, which is combining uh, data from XMM Newton, Chandra, and uh, Hubble Space Telescope. This is the first, um, I think, um, clear identification of an intermediate uh, mass uh, black hole, uh, which has actually been identified through uh, a so called tidal capture event where a star is getting too close to that black hole is disrupted. And then you see a flare of X-ray uh, emission. And Hubble actually was able to localize this object uh, in a globular cluster. But this is a globular cluster, which is actually not in our own Milky Way, but it is an extra galactic globular cluster. And so this could then identify this um, several um, 10,000 uh, solar mass black hole uh, in the uh, center of this globular cluster. And this little movie also shows the fascinating phenomena that you have when a black hole is moving in front of a star field. And this is what is called also microlensing, um, which um, I will come to in my next um, slide. Because our other hero, Gaia, the mission that has now superseded uh, the uh, Hubble Space Telescope in the number of publications. Uh, it's really uh, amazing, about three to four papers a day coming out from, from Gaia, so it's hard to keep track. But one of the things that fascinates me um, was the discoveries around microlensing that Gaia um, is doing. So when you look at a stellar field like the galactic center or the Magellanic clouds or the Andromeda Nebula, then it can be that it's a dark object is moving in front of a star. And then through le gravitational lensing, the light from the star is amplified on one hand. But as we will later also see, there, will, uh, there are also dynamic um, effects. And we have a lot of these uh, microlensing programs uh, because they were originally uh, meant to look for dark matter uh, in the halo of our galaxy, machos, eros, orgel, and so on. And uh, the, the Orgel um, uh, survey in particular has recently identified a number of relatively long microlensing events, several years long. And those are prone to be actually from rather massive, um, uh, from rather massive dark objects. Uh, and there was actually an interesting result published a few months ago 
where Orgel has now identified 60 of these long, long duration micro lensing events. Um, and for 20 of those, roughly 20 of those, Gaia could actually determine parallax distances. And it turned out that the um, objects are only a few kiloparsecs uh, away. And so you can actually break the or reduce the mass um, distance degeneracy. And you estimate that the masses of the lenses are actually in the range between one and 10 solar masses. If you have a five solar mass object at a distance of a kiloparsec, it should be a bright star, but this is not a bright star. <laughs> and so therefore the authors conclude that it is likely that these are black holes. And these would be black holes, which are in the middle of the so-called mass gap between the neutron stars on one hand and between the more normal black holes uh, on the other um, side. And this yellow line in the background is actually a theoretical model that is predicting primordial black holes to also have a maximum around the Chandrasekha mass. And so this would be, might be the first glimpse of a direct detection of primordial black holes that could in principle um, be the dark matter. And this ties in nicely with recent results from uh, LIGO uh, and Virgo gravitational mergers. You know that there was this surprising large number of very massive uh, black hole mergers. Um, several tens of solar masses merging into 60, 80 solar mass black holes. And comparison to the more normal stellar remnants that we believe to come from the stellar evolution. Uh, and now recently there was a discovery of uh, one object which came out of the mass gap. So it's more massive than the normal neutron stars, but less massive than the black holes, which merged together with a 20 solar mass black hole to form a 22 or 23 solar mass black holes. And so these objects in the mass gap are in principle the same mass range that Orgel Gaia has also identified. And so it may be that we are seeing the glimpse of dark matter here. And this is, would be extremely exciting and is giving very bright um, possibilities for the future. And one of these possibilities comes actually uh, with the um, Nancy Grace Roman Space Telescope that NASA is planning. Uh, this is another uh, simulation of a 10 solar mass black hole moving in front of a star field. And what you are expecting is not only a micro lensing um, amplification, but you also, when you look in detail, you expect that the black hole is actually moving around on the sphere, like, like this simulation shows. And you need a resolution of about a milli arc second to, to do that. And this is exactly the resolution that W first with its two meter mirror will provide. And so it is really very reassuring to see that our friends and colleagues at NASA are so um, kind of trustful in the future of the telescope that they gave it a very powerful name of uh, Nancy Grace Roman. So we are looking forward and ESA's participation to that um, W first uh, project is in particular to bring down a significantly larger number of data, which is necessary in order to do micro lensing. Um, the, the cosmological service, they only want to look at the sky as a static picture, but we would like to get the dynamic um, uh, data from the sky down. And this is uh, very interesting for the future. And that brings me to back to Gaia, to one of the recent highlights that has been published in Nature um, uh, just a few weeks ago. Um, Gaia now also is starting to look at the spectra of the stars. Um, in, the, uh, in the next release of the, the Gaia data, we will also get the spectra of uh, many millions of stars. And using the spectra, you can actually look at the star forming history uh, of the galaxy uh, by looking at the basically star formation rate um, of the stars nearby. And what you see here is the history of the star formation rate over the uh, basically course of the history in, in our uh, own galaxy. And there are these uh, ominous uh, uh, peaks in star formation rate. Uh, the, the most prominent one of them is about 5.7 billion years ago, which is exactly the time when the solar system was formed. And these star formation peaks are actually associated with the um, orbit of the Sagittarius dwarf galaxy around our Milky Way. And whenever the Sagittarius dwarf galaxy is actually crashing through the disk of the Milky Way, uh, it is expected that you have an increase in, in local star formation rate. And so you can actually identify each of these peaks with phenomena, this one, the 5.7 billion uh, years where the sun may have uh, been formed. 
then another one 1.9 billion years ago when it came around again. Uh, one billion year ago, it came around again. And currently it is again in the Milky Way. And so this actually really shows how Gaia fulfills the promise to unravel, to de-sculpture the history of our Milky Way. Uh, and that brings me to the future and to the long-term future. Uh, so, you know, I already told you that we are currently living in a very exciting time in the 2020s where we, we have launched Bepi Colombo, we have launched Solar Orbiter, we have launched Cheops. We are preparing Euclid to be launched. And um, somebody on the web has asked, I mean, what are the uh, implications of COVID um, on the um, mission preparations in particular for JWST, but also for Euclid and Juice, we have some few months of COVID uh, impact on the schedule. We have to try, we have tried to contain it as much as possible. But I think Euclid currently is looking at about a three months delay. And for Juice, we are still hanging on uh, to the May 22 launch date, also it's getting tighter and tighter. And so internally, we are also looking at the realistic um, in possibility of having to launch in September 2022. Uh, JWST also was able to continue during the COVID crisis, but there were some important things that could not be done with social distancing. So for instance, uh, the uh, vertical deployable tower assembly test uh, where the whole spacecraft is hanging on the roof um, uh, with all these several tonnage of, um, of weight. And these tests have to be done very quickly because you don't want the situation to persist throughout an earthquake uh, period. And so this test had to be done with a full team present at the site and that could only be done uh, after the peak um, COVID uh, problems uh, have been managed. Okay, I talked about, um, we'll talk about Plato, we'll, which will, is going on the, so, the so, uh, exosolar planet uh, mission and Ariel, uh, which is uh, the spectroscopic exosolar planet mission. I talked about Comet Interceptor and currently we are preparing the selection of the uh, candidate um, of the M5 mission which is still a competition between three candidates, um, uh, Envision, a Mars mission, Spica, a far infrared telescope, and Cetheus, uh, a gamma ray burst plus infrared telescope mission. So this will become very difficult to, a, a very hard choice because all of these three missions are extremely exciting. And then we are preparing our big flagship missions, uh, Athena and Lisa. And you see the thickness of these bars is roughly the amount of money that we need in every year to prepare these missions. There's a 10 year or 11 year preparation phase for both of these missions. And we have to face them in a way that we can still afford the total um, money in, in the budget. And so therefore we will try to start Athena as soon as possible, hopefully in 24, 23. Sorry, no, um, already uh, um, in 22. And then uh, we want to start LISA a few years later. Uh, we are in, in discussion with our member states currently to interject another flexi mission similar to Comet Interceptor, which could actually fly roughly at the same time as the M5 mission. But you see that our program is already quite full and quite exciting. And so I'm really looking forward to a whole decade of very um, heavy work for us. But we are not um, uh, stopping here. As many of you know, we have started um, a strategic planning exercise similar to Horizon 2000 and Cosmic Vision. We are now in the preparation phase of Voyage 2050, which will define the ESA program after the LISA mission has been launched. And last fall, we had a big workshop in Madrid where we were actually pre uh, presenting 100 white papers from the community. And it is very good to know that the teams that are actually um, uh, discussing and selecting the future priorities have been able to continue over the COVID uh, situation. And indeed um, their outcome and their ex uh, recommendations are expected in fall this year. Um, and so this will also give us important inputs for the next ministerial conference in space uh, 22, where the future um, will be decided, uh, including the effects of COVID. And with this, I would like to stop here and I'm happy to answer questions uh, from the audience. Thank you very much.
Thank you so much, Ginter, for that fantastic presentation. It's really uplifting to see all of the new science coming um, from, from all the missions um, that ESA are, are leading, which is just fantastic. OK, we've got time for a couple of questions here, um, and then we'll take some other questions in the panel session later. So first of all, I have a question for you about is there any astronomical measure being taken to deflect potential asteroids coming near the Earth? Uh, yes, indeed. Uh, there are actually pro projects that are dealing with uh, asteroid defense. Um, this is a uh, boundary. I think it's a borderline between astronomy and planetary um, uh, protection uh, because astronomy is necessary to identify these objects. Uh, planetary protection is necessary to kind of do something about it. And indeed, there is one uh, project between NASA and ESA. It's the so-called double asteroid um, uh, DART mission, du double asteroid, whatever, uh, uh, test, where actually NASA will uh, inject um, a small spacecraft into a moon uh, of, an, of a nearby asteroid. And then ESA will fly there and study the asteroid crater and study how the moon is rotating and so on. And this is actually an important test to see whether you could deflect an asteroid from its way um, to the Earth. There are a few other techniques like shining a laser beam or nuking the asteroids or uh, one that I like very much is when you have enough time, you could fly there and paint the asteroid white on one side and then the solar pressure would kind of stop the rotation and push it out. So there are lots of um, in, interesting ideas, uh, uh, but we need time to do that. And that means we need to determine or to detect these asteroids early enough. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and I have another question, um, which is about how can science popularizers, so I think that means people who promote public understanding of science, for example, be involved in some of the ESA initiatives and missions, and could there be a sort of global collaboration of, of those people? Yeah, we would be very interested. I mean, we are already actively reaching out in, in, in our um, events, typically the launches or also the, uh, the release of the images of Solar Orbiter uh, usually draw a very large uh, crowd of people. We had actually during the Bepi Colombo flyby, we organized a, a chatterton or something like that where we invited a group of um, very active um, uh, Twitter users to, to chat about that. We are trying to popularize our mission state. Each of them has a, its own Twitter account. So whatever idea you have, please um, uh, come with it. We are very happy to incorporate um, these, um, all these possibilities. Yeah, thank you. And I think it's, again, it's that sort of the way that we're working at the moment in this online format for, for a lot of the time, we're finding that that we get really good engagement by streaming things online. So it's, a, it's, yes. a, it's an opportunity. Um, OK, so one more quick question for you, which I think you mentioned briefly, but perhaps you could just uh, respond. Um, you've given us an excellent review of current and planned missions. Can you just say what the timeline is for announcing the future plans and outcomes from Voyager uh, 20 uh, 2050? Yes. Yeah. So actually, uh, this fall, we hope that we can actually um, come up, uh, not with a glossy brochure, but at least with a, a draft uh, of the recommendations. Uh, what we um, hope that the committee is doing is that they will select three topics for the next three big L missions. So, so the same thing that uh, Cosmic Vision has done in selecting Jews, uh, Lisa and Athena. We are now in the process of selecting basically the next three big blocks after that. Not necessarily the sequence of them or exactly the, the name or the, the exact scope, but the field and the technology necessary for the development. Uh, and then we also um, hope that the committee will give us about eight or so highlight topics for possible emissions, but we do not select emissions beforehand. And all of that should actually happen in fall this year. So it's relatively nearby. OK, that's something to look forward to. It'll be interesting to see the, the sort of themes that are emerging from, from that from that program. So that's really exciting. Thank you. Thanks very much for now, Gunther. And I'll speak to you again uh, yes. shortly. OK, Thank you. thanks. OK, so next, um, I'm delighted to welcome uh, Graham Turnick, who is the CEO of the UK Space Agency. 
Uh, Graeme, again, thanks ever so much for joining us this morning uh, for this community meeting. Um, we're just getting your slides up now, so I'm hoping that I can hand over to you now for the UKSA presentation. Thanks, Graeme. Thanks very much, Emma. I hope I'm coming across clearly. Do let me know if not. Fantastic. Okay, well, really delighted to be here this morning. Um, a very important year, obviously, for the Royal Astronomical Society. It's also, interestingly, 200 years uh, since Hans Christian Ørsted, a um, great Danish physicist and, and chemist, discovered that uh, magnetic needles were deflected by the presence of a nearby electronic current. Of course, this then uh, forms the basis for all of uh, the studies that we've carried out with magnetometers uh, in space. And I'll come to that uh, a couple of times during this presentation. Um, so science at the UK Space Agency, if we can have the next slide, please. Um, uh, just to uh, give you a brief overview, um, uh, what, what do we do in the UK Space Agency and how does space science uh, fall into the wider context? So. Um, essentially, the UK Space Agency is here to support um, the uh, delivery of space science in terms of uh, hardware um, primarily, but also increasingly uh, the software and the systems and the ground systems that support that um, in space. And uh, historically, our main focus has been to do that through membership of the European Space Agency. In the last 10 years, however, we've had an increasing focus on the commercial use of space and growing the UK uh, space sector. Uh, our target is to achieve a 10% share of that space sector by 2030. And we've seen some really exciting developments in the sector over the last 10 years with the growth, for example, of the Harwell cluster, but also um, uh, significant growth in space engineering in places like Glasgow. Also Cornwall has become a real hub of the space industry with um, people like Goon Hilly, and of course now um, the uh, Cornwall um, uh, Space uh, Flight uh, Initiative, um, uh, down in uh, Newquay and uh, places such as um, the Northeast have focused uh, heavily on space as well. Um, uh, the um, traditional focus, uh, I suppose, would be on um, areas like Earth observation, as I've mentioned, space science, um, and obviously the UK's long standing expertise in telecoms. Um, but a big new focus, just talked about Cornwall, is space flight. UK has um, really excellent uh, geography for launching uh, polar satellites, not really that great for um, equatorial geostationary satellites, but with the great focus now on uh, constellations of communication satellites and Earth observation satellites, really the polar or the sun synchronous orbit is, is the one that people want to get into. Of course, that means launching north or south and um, UK is particularly well suited to launch north um, given the uh, relatively sparsely populated areas in that direction. Um, so space flight has been a big focus and we are working hard to get launched in the UK early in the 2020s. Um, another big uh, focus in the agency is the whole field of space applications, really using space data to make life better on Earth. We expect that to be the major growth in the sector over the next 10 years. And um, we're working both uh, in the UK, but also in particular through programs like our International Partnerships Program to support the use of space applications. I saw an amazing project in South Africa last year, really just using a fairly simple combination of satellite and telecommunications and positioning to help um, uh, uh, small scale fishermen stay safe. They can't afford the uh, expensive uh, radios that you would expect to find in developed countries and fishing vessels. So we created a very, very uh, cheap um, communications device, which uh, can ensure that they can be tracked even when their mobile phone uh, perhaps moves out of uh, reach of uh, the coastal transmission. Um, also, a big focus clearly is uh, planetary exploration. Uh, this is very much uh, Mars month. Uh, you'll have picked up, I'm sure, on the launch of the UAE um, uh, probe going off to Mars. Um, uh, it's a shame that we won't be able to get uh, the Rosalind Franklin rover onto the surface of Mars this year, um, but we will obviously be looking to achieve that in two years' time. And then navigation, um, big focus really for us in the agency since we've um, uh, uh, decided not to take part in the Galileo program, um, a large team looking at um, uh, the prospects for a UK sovereign system. So uh, with that, I'll move on and focus a little bit more for the rest of the presentation on space science. 
Okay, the next slide, please. Um, so um, uh, space science um, uh, in the UK obviously has a long and distinguished history um, with the uh, first aerial missions in the 1960s, Aerial One being launched in 1962. And I was very delighted to have an, a very nice chat with Ken Pounds recently, who was one of the um, uh, leaders of one of the uh, instruments on that mission. Uh, still going strong. Uh, after almost 60 years, which is pretty impressive and shows the staying power and stamina of, of our uh, space science sector. Um, uh, our focus really is to achieve obviously maximum benefits to the UK um, science sector from our contributions, as I've mentioned, to ESA through the Mandatory Science Programme. Um, why is that important? Well, obviously, it's also not just important for space science, but it's important because those kind of blue skies um, projects, really challenging projects that we carry out into space science are also a fantastic testing ground for technology and for our industry. Um, so we've seen, um, uh, uh, for example, um, use of electronic propulsion developed um, in um, uh, missions for space science, um, then deployed um, in uh, telecommunications satellite um, data processing, um, such as we're developing on uh, the PLATO uh, project, um, have applications uh, more widely in industry. Um, uh, one of uh, the most, um, uh, so we've got uh, on this slide, just some examples of some uh, existing projects. And um, um, I will um, talk a little bit about some of these um, uh, amazing, um, so just to complete my, um, remarks on why we do it. Um, so both obviously to extract that amazing science out of leading edge investigations, but also as I say, to equip our industry to be on the forefront of uh, technological developments that then can be applied in the commercial space sector and also um, generate innovations that can be of uh, value more generally in society. So um, uh, you've heard from Gunter um, quite a lot about some of the uh, missions that uh, we are planning through ESA, I'd like to talk a little bit about some of the instruments that the UK is leading on on those missions. And really to concentrate on a couple in particular on this slide. So we saw um, the fantastic images of Solar Orbiter uh, that uh, were released last week. Um, uh, some campfires as they're being uh, uh, described. I'm not sure that's a campfire I'd want to sit particularly close to or roast my marshmallows over. Um, but um, some very interesting emerging observations coming through there. And we'll see even more amazing uh, pictures and get even more interesting information when uh, Solar Orbiter reaches operational orbit in 2021. James Webb Space Telescope, of course, um, the long heralded successor to Hubble. Um, the uh, UK has been leading on uh, the European Consortium to bid the, uh, build the mid infrared instrument uh, benefits from uh, the largest mirror uh, that has ever been flown um, uh, in uh, space. Um, Euclid um, is the um, dark um, matter um, uh, mission that the UK is leading on the VIS camera for. Um, the VIS camera um, is really the most sophisticated um, optical imaging camera that we've yet seen. It is formed of 36 um, uh, charge coupled devices um, built um, by uh, E2 Leeds Halidine in uh, Chelmsford. I had the pleasure of seeing um, uh, that uh, company and the amazing capabilities uh, that it has a couple of years ago. Um, uh, the images will be 70 times larger than Hubble um, and enable a very precise uh, measurements of the size of galaxies, and their physical size that they and then be paired up with the, um, uh, the infrared imager, which will measure the redshift and help us to understand better um, the nature of dark matter. Um, obviously, as Gunter mentioned, very exciting year, 2022. Obviously, we'll expect to see um, uh, Russell and Franklin launch, hopefully then, um, uh, and we've got Jupiter icy moons also planned to launch, then, of which I'd like to come on to next. So, Jupiter icy moon uh, moons. Um, first of all, it's just worth reflecting on how exciting a mission that is. Um, uh, the plan is to launch it, as I say, in uh, 2022. Um, it um, will benefit from uh, no fewer than five gravity assists just to get to Jupiter, 
um, a combination of Earth, Venus, Earth, Mars and Earth. So just imagine that weaving in and out of those uh, three planets. And then after seven years, it, it finally gets to Jupiter um, uh, uh, and then uses um, uh, multiple uh, gravity assists uh, of Ganymede and Callisto to enter into orbit around Jupiter and then to move on to um, uh, entering into orbit. First time ever um, that a spacecraft will orbit a moon other than our own moon in the solar system, uh, and it will orbit um, uh, Ganymede um, to carry out um, uh, detailed observations there. On board um, the Jupiter icy moons mission, we will have a magnetometer, mentioned that at the start of the talk, um, uh, being uh, built by um, our friends um, at Imperial College um, under the leadership of Michelle Doherty, um, continuing um, the work that was begun by our previous chair of the UK Space Agency, um, David Southwood. Um, it will be carried on a 10 meter boom. It's very important, as I mentioned, of course. Uh, the uh, compasses, compasses are deflected by electric signal sets. We kept well away from the spacecraft and all of its electrical activity. Um, uh, uh, and obviously, if you've got a 10 meter boom, then you've got some pretty big challenges because that doesn't normally fit inside the nose cone of a rocket. So that has to be a deployable boom deployable boom and there are some obviously uh, you know big technical challenges to ensure that, that works effectively. So how's that going? Well despite COVID um, the um, flight model um, has uh, been integrated and again it's testing at Fujix Hafen, uh, the Airbus facilities there um, and um, uh, we'll be carrying out uh, further testing before going to AirStech in 2021. Um, the engineering model um, is in Toulouse, and that's already been tested, in particular um, looking to make sure that the magnetometer uh, behaves uh, effectively, as I've just described. So Jupiter icy moons, an incredibly exciting mission um, that um, uh, we will have a very important part of. Um, just very briefly, SMILE, um, uh, another mission um, working jointly with um, China, um, uh, looking at uh, the um, solar, um, winds and their interaction with our magnetosphere and that would be due to launch in 2023 and again we are focusing um, there on x-rays and other of our strengths in the UK with the building of the soft x-ray imager and then finally Plato, um, uh, Dante has mentioned Plato, um, uh, we will be uh, again um, uh, contributing significantly on the imaging there again drawing our strengths in uh, CCDs. Um, I won't talk too much about the slides on this page, um, other because uh, Gunter's already talked about them quite a lot, other than to say we're delighted to have the uh, principal investigator role on Ariel. Um, we're of course looking forward to Athena, um, the X-ray observatory mission planned in 2033. And then of course, um, the Comet Interceptor fast class mission that will launch along with Ariel on the same launch vehicle in 2028. Um, is um, uh, again a mission that delights to have the principal investigation role on. Finally, I'll just say a few words about Lisa. Um, uh, Lisa is part of the L3, um, uh, is the L3 mission um, planned for the 2030s. Hopefully, if we can extend Athena, we'll get some overlap of um, Lisa uh, and Athena for a good period of time. As Gunter has described, it's uh, like seeing the movies with sound. Um, we can both uh, we can study the same events, because of course the waves all travel at the speed of light, um, both in terms of the gravitational waves that they create and in terms of the X-ray um, uh, 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 light that they emit. Um, uh, Lisa is comprised of, I'm sure uh, most of you are familiar with Lisa, comprised of three spacecraft that will um, travel um, in the form of a triangle, and then they will measure um, very, very accurately the distance between them. They're guided um, by uh, reference um, uh, uh, weights, if you like, that um, are protected from any form of interference other than uh, gravity by the um, outside of the spacecraft. Um, uh, and then adjustments are made to the, uh, the flight of the spacecraft to effectively keep up with those um, reference objects inside. The measurement is done by uh, means of uh, optical interferometry and the uh, key instrument um, uh, that uh, enables that is um, really the um, 
uh, brainchild of a uh, team at Glasgow uh, led by Harry Ward. I was delighted to be uh, shown um, uh, some of uh, the work of that team when I visited them a couple of years ago. Um, uh, they successfully uh, trialled that um, uh, equipment um, on Lisa Pathfinder a few years ago. Um, with the construction of Lisa itself, they'll need many more of the so-called optical benches um, to enable that than uh, they produce the Lisa Pathfinder. And so um, uh, we're working with them to um, um, uh, make the construction of those optical benches um, as um, automated as we possibly can. Essentially, the little um, uh, sort of glass prisms that enable that measurement were positioned painstakingly by hand for uh, Lisa Pathfinder. Um, a very, very um, a challenging process. And we'll, as I say, be looking to move on into the industrialization of the optical bench um, for uh, the future. Um, uh, right, if I could have the next slide, please, um, uh, see what we've got. Um, uh, so I've spoken a little bit about um, uh, the optical bench. There it is. Uh, you can see those little prisms uh, at the front um, uh, doing an amazing job of uh, uh, breaking up the light and then uh, getting it to recombine so that we can judge um, uh, very, very tiny uh, shifts in wavelength. And there's obviously some of the electronics uh, that's required to support it above. Um, and the next slide, please. Uh, some thoughts on the future. Um, so obviously, um, uh, it is really critical for us to engage with you as a community from the uh, point of view of the UK Space Agency. We're here to support you. Um, uh, we obviously uh, work hard with you to secure principal investigator roles and then to um, work on the uh, construction of the instruments that go into the spacecraft. Um, uh, it's absolutely essential that, that we have an extremely good, and I hope uh, uh, I hope we do have an extremely good um, uh, uh, communication with you. Um, so we do that through um, our, obviously the SPAC, through the Space Academic Network, and we work closely with the RIS on our vision for the future. Um, we obviously want to continue to secure strong roles in these science programs. Um, uh, we are um, looking to build on that increasingly now through national work. Um, we are uh, looking to use the um, new National Space Innovation Programme uh, to uh, both support um, industrial uh, R&D, but also um, uh, science missions. And we're particularly keen to support um, uh, bilateral science missions um, to build uh, even more strongly some of our international relationships. Um, the um, uh, future, I think, going forward is also you know, one that we critically need to manage closely with UKRI. It's very good to hear Mark's talk earlier and the many mentions that he made uh, quite correctly of working closely um, together between the Space Agency and SDFC. We have a dual key um, to ensure that uh, when we do um, support mission development, there are um, missions that are going to be uh, of real use and value to the UK science community. So not only do we develop and deliver uh, fantastic data from our missions, but we can also then um, use that for um, development of um, scientific programs, of research and uh, amazing um, uh, research uh, by the UK more generally. Um, uh, and really ensuring the optimum use of uh, mission data, I think is a key area of joint interest between us. Um, now, people touched on various other things, and there are lots of things we could talk about, um, such as National Space Council, um, uh, such as uh, constellations, their impact on astronomy. Um, uh, so I'm really uh, happy to take questions on both what I've just talked about, but also more general questions in the Q&A session. Thank you very much. Graham, thank you so much for that presentation. And again, it's it's very inspiring to see so much excellent science coming from the UK, uh, being funded by the UK Space Agency. Um, sorry that some of your slides, I think, were hidden in the presentation, so um, they didn't they didn't show in presentation mode. But um, thank you for talking through um, the, the details of your presentation with us. That was fantastic. Um, so I'm going to ask you personally a quick question now and then I think we'll switch to panel mode and we'll have a more general discussion on some of those items that you just mentioned as well. Um, so a question specifically for you Graham, 
um, having um, seen that the moon figured prominently on your title slide, we have a question about um, moon related science activities in the UK and how difficult it is. Um, so the essence of the question is, is there hope to see lunar science activities included in Aurora announcement of opportunities in coming years? Um, so, I mean, this does go a little bit to our relationship with SDFC, um, because our focus in the Space Agency um, has been to support science through exploration. Um, now, obviously, exploration has been uh, largely focused on Mars recently, but of course we are um, uh, returning a strong focus to exploration on the Moon. Um, and the Moon is great testing ground for um, uh, things such as understanding how we can live um, in space. Um, uh, the uh, Open University um, are doing some very interesting research into how you can extract water from a regolith and then obviously how you can um, uh, make use of that. Um, so um, I'm happy to take that question away in a little bit more detail, um, uh, but certainly, uh, you know, we want to make full value of our investment in the exploration program. Uh, we don't want a gap to open up between, as I say, supporting missions um, and then um, the science that SDSC choose to support. So I think between the two of us, we need to ensure that that gap is filled, and I'm very happy to take that away and uh, see if I can provide a more detailed answer. Um, uh, after the meeting. That's great. Thank you, Graham. Okay, so I think um, if we can switch now to our panel mode, we should see a few faces appearing. <laughs> I've got lots of fantastic questions for you. So um, we've got about 25 minutes. I hope that's okay with all of you. Um, we've got a variety of questions. Some are specifically for individuals and some are more general. So I'm going to try and sort of lead us through some of those questions and hopefully you can just chip in and answer um, those general ones as you wish. So first of all, I'm going to go to a question, bear with me, um, about satellite constellations, as Graham just mentioned. So the question is, as hundreds of Starlink satellites are already in orbit, what is the thought process or steps being taken, if any, to keep astronomy safe from it? So this is about the, the, the issues of, of the impact of mega constellations on our science. So I don't know who, if anyone would like to volunteer to start with, with that question. Maybe I can give it a try or maybe, maybe yeah, why don't you say start, Mark? <laughs> I mean, I, I, I mean, I mean, I, I can speak speak to this question certainly from the radio astronomy side, just from my perspective as a board member of SKA. Um, there clearly is a potential issue here. Um, the strategy really is to to engage engage with the com companies and look look for mitigation strategies. So this is an on, on, ongoing discussion. Um, so also with the agency as well. The agency is clearly a, an important player in this, but. Um, I think I mean it's 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 a question of engaging and looking for the right strategies to mitigate mitigate the impacts. Yeah. I'm okay. To that. So yeah, Gunther, did, did you want yeah. to say? Yeah. Uh, from in in terms of astronomy, uh, I mean optical uh, astronomy. I think the IAU and the AAS are in direct contact with uh, some of the companies. Um, from my point of view. The classical um, narrow field astronomy is not so much uh, affected by the mega constellations, but indeed the wide field astronomy with, uh, for instance, the Vera Rubin telescope coming up uh, can be affected. But I think it is much more, I think the beauty of the night sky and the, a lot of the um, non-professional astronomy applications that are suffering the most. So it's clear that whatever can be done to reduce the impact uh, has to be done. And I think there are already steps taken in that direction. Yeah. Thank you. So, yeah, I mean, if I can add, um, uh, we're obviously concerned about this. I mean, we have a double interest now, obviously, that the UK has invested in OneWeb. Um, uh, we were previously uh, and still are uh, the regulator for OneWeb in terms of their uh, in-orbit uh, activity. Um, and um, obviously, you know, like uh, SDFC and ESA, we're concerned um, to ensure that we can have um, uh, effective uh, sort of coexistence in space um, with astronomy operations. 
Um, one of the things that we're doing in the UK, which I didn't mention, is uh, a lot more work on um, space surveillance and tracking. So we are uh, talking to um, uh, people at Hurstman Zoo who have uh, great expertise in optical tracking just to try and get a better understanding of the actual impact of, uh, of those satellites on uh, ground-based astronomy. Okay, fantastic. Thank, thank you all for that. Um, the next couple of questions are related. So the first question is, how do you see the UK replacing the loss of EU funding streams such as the ERC? And the second related question is, astronomy has done very well out of Horizon 2020, but that means it's very vulnerable to the UK not participating in Horizon Europe. Um, so how is STFC engaging with government on the importance of retaining UK involvement in Horizon programmes? So, Mark, I don't know whether... Yeah. I mean, it's, uh, I mean, obviously, this is not STFC. It's a case of UKRI as a whole, um, and you know, of course, UK UKRI is involved in these discussions uh, with, with government, and and, uh, and 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 given the fact that it's kind of aligned to the whole the whole question of how we associate and how we interact with the EU in the future, I, I don't think there should be an assumption that we're we're not going to associate to Horizon Europe. Um, and I think the question is, what happens if we don't? Uh, and of course, if we do, the, the, I mean, the I think the scientific case for association, I think, yeah, has been made clear by the community. Um, UKRI obviously are looking at looking at all, all scenarios as a government, um, and there may be ways of um, mitigating the impact if we don't associate. I think the risk for astronomy um, is that if, if, if there is some alternative put in place, then astronomy may not do as well as it does currently through the ERC. So certainly within the discussions with UKRI, I have always emphasised that there are a number of communities that are would be disproportionately affected, and astronomy uh, in the STFC world is, is, is the one. But there are, there are others in the arts and humanities which get an even larger fraction of their resources through the ERC. So I think it's just a question of making people aware that, you know, that, that uh, we don't want to disrupt the system. So look, looking at ways that, that if, if there were a replacement scheme, that, if that's what government decides, that, that uh, we, we provide some level of continuity. It's a very, it's a very, it's a very, it's a very tricky question, but um, this issue I've raised with UKRI many, many times. So people are aware and astronomy is not alone in this. Okay, thank you, thank you, Mark. Um, so I'm just going to move on to a couple of questions that are, again are related. Um, so the first is, will Brexit adversely affect the UK involvement in ESA? I hope not, exclamation mark. And similarly, uh, with Brexit being locked out of Galileo and missing out on Sentinel bids, do you foresee a change in our relationship with ESA? So I think this could be a good question for maybe everybody to, to, to respond to, if that's okay. But maybe, Ginter, could we, could we start with you? Yeah, so uh, uh, as regards to the science program, the scientific program, the UK is really one of the uh, cornerstones and the uh, founding um, uh, foundations of the ESA science program, both in the, the leading of instruments, the PI ships of missions and so on, and in the future, at least in the foreseeable future, I don't see any change in that. So I, I would hope that the UK will maintain its strong leadership position and maybe even increase it. Uh, however, in the areas that are more affected by the EU relations like Galileo Copernicus, uh, this is something that um, is a little bit beyond my uh, pay grade, but uh, uh, may maybe uh, Graham is something uh, that's something that Graham can address. Thanks, Peter. Graham, would you like? To... Yes, yes. Yeah. So, um, in relation to um, the um, recent um, Copernicus um, Sentinel round, um, we shouldn't uh, forget that uh, we've been actually really quite successful, with the exception of Airbus uh, not securing one of the primes, and we will be represented with some really important roles in five out of the six uh, missions. Um, uh, we would, through this round, be under-returned, but we're over-returned in other areas of the uh, ESA Earth Observation Programme. Uh, you can't get perfect uh, geo-return on each uh, uh, programme while maintaining, obviously, a principle of, of competition. Um, so it's not something we're sort of excessively worrying about at the moment, but it is clearly not helpful to uh, anybody to have uncertainty 
uh, prolonging the over and whether we will be part of uh, Copernicus going forward. So you know, in the agency, we're very keen to see um, uh, negotiations on that um, are complete. Um, there is a commitment, obviously, to try and um, uh, uh, establish um, our future role in Copernicus um, uh, over the coming months. It's very much part of the negotiations. Um, and, uh, you know, I'll be working closely with my colleagues in the Department of Business uh, to ensure that we can take those negotiations forward, you know, very positively. And as I say, you know, clearly as rapidly as we possibly can. Um, in relation to Galileo, then I think, yeah, clearly that, uh, that decision has been taken. And I talked a little bit earlier about the work that we're doing um, in the UK to look at um, uh, satellite navigation from a, a national perspective. Thank you, Brian. Thank you. Mark, would you like to add anything? No, I think, I think Graham's given a, given a good answer from the UK perspective. That's great. Thank you very much. Um, OK, so the next question, um, I think, is, is perhaps for, for Graham and Mark again. It's, it's posed in the context of STFC, um, but has STFC had any discussions about the role of the new UK ARPA and how this may alter STFC's role in funding? Um. I, would, I mean, firstly, I mean, I, th I think ARPA is somewhat, dis whatever ARPA turns into, is actually somewhat distinct. Um, it has a, I mean, the funding line that was put forward um, is not, is not super, I mean, it sounds like a large number, but actually it's not a very large number in the context of the UKRI um, budgets. So I can, I can answer this from the UKRI perspective. I mean, we see it as doing something different from the UKRI. Uh, in terms of the level of resources, it's actually rather small compared to the UKRI budget. Um, exactly how it's going to be implemented, I don't, I don't think anyone knows. I certainly don't know. Uh, but from the UKRI and STFC perspective, we, we don't perceive this as a threat or anything. Uh, it's uh, you know, potentially a different, a different way of doing things differently in, in addition to what we're doing now. I think, that's, I think that's the reassurance that people would like to have, that it yeah. doesn't actually impact the, the current funding um, from, from SDFC or indeed... No, that's, from... that's certainly our, our, our assumption and our understanding. Yeah. Okay, that's great. Graham, would you like to add anything to that or...? No, just to say, I think it's exciting that there's obviously a big focus on um, you know, leading edge R&D research. Um, we're already doing some things in that space with people like uh, Reaction Engines on the Sabre rocket engine, so, uh, you know, it's encouraging that that's um, clearly a drive behind our Okay, it'll be interesting to see how that develops. Um, okay, so, uh, and apologies, because my neighbour has just started drilling, so I'm, I, I can't really control that, so there could be some background noise from my side. Um, so the next question we have um, about Blue Skies research, um, which describes most of what our community engages in, might be seen as somewhat self-indulgent in the post-COVID world, and this could pose a real danger. So this is a, a general question to all three of you. Any thoughts on how this could be created? So how we continue to make the case for Blue Skies research? Maybe I can address that. Yeah. And I think it's also addressing a question that uh, Chris Lee has um, further down, which is uh, going in a long similar vein. I mean, it's clear that um, in the current COVID and post-COVID <clears throat> crisis situation, uh, we are very much focused on the economy, um, on the uh, immediate impacts. Um, uh, and I do not yet know in which direction it will go. It, it could go down, but I think there's also a chance that there is actually an increase in spending in order to um, basically com compensate for some of the economic losses. <laughs> this increase in spending uh, will clearly go for the most economic um, uh, benefit. But I think it always comes along with some um, a general, I think, uh, appreciation of um, technology development and, uh, um, and science. And I think a very, very um, important aspect of the mid to long term is that we need a new generation of uh, leaders, uh, future um, young leaders, um, in particular from <clears throat> all, all um, different uh, backgrounds and diversities. And science and uh, space technology and science are really one of the, uh, I, I think, drawing um, forces of, for, for young people to get into uh, those powers. So I hope that, um, there will be a, a balance where there is still enough uh, money 
also um, available for basic and fundamental research. But I think the only real thing that we can do is more or less to come back with exciting messages, with exciting results. And we are doing our best to do that, as you see. Absolutely. Maybe I can give, I can give my, my perspective on this. I mean, I think the government's R&D roadmap that was published uh, you know, a couple of weeks back, you know, c committing to the rise of you know, R&D spending to 22 billion per annum, significant rise, really shows that I think this government recognises the importance of science and technology for the future of the UK's economy. Um, so from a purely economic argument, uh, post-COVID, I mean, I, I, mean, I see the development of advanced technology as part, you know, as part of the, uh, the recovery. Um, and the fact that this particular government is uh, clearly pushing science and technology very hard, I, I would say that's a good, a good message. So I, I think there's an opportunity here actually for us in the UK to really step up the amount of investment we put in early stage, early stage technology and just the fu fundamental science across the board. I'm, pre I'm pretty op optimistic actually. That's great. <laughs> Thanks, Mark. Graham, would you like to add anything else or you have Yeah, I think just to yeah. you know, echo what I was saying earlier about the value of um, uh, some of these really challenging blue skies projects, they really help push the technology uh, over hurdles that I don't think industry would necessarily um, be able to overcome themselves, you know, both because of the, um, uh, the focus on you know, mission achievement uh, and the need to achieve that mission. So you know, if we're gonna to go to Jupiter, there are just certain massive problems that have to be overcome. Um, but also, you know, the really bright people that then we've got uh, in our uh, academic and obviously uh, industrial sectors that can then apply their minds to those challenges. And, you know, the UK has done so well out of its focus on fundamental science investment over the last 100 years um, with a huge number of Nobel Prize winners. Um, that, I think, as Mark says, you know, is understood and is reflected in the R&D policy. Um, so, yeah. For, for my own part, I, I see a very strong push behind fundamental R&D, and I would encourage researchers to put forward very challenging projects, which will require really big technological um, challenges to be able to cover. Thank you, Graham. That's great. Okay, so our next question um, is, um, ha as has been said, we are all expecting a comprehensive spending review to set future funding. Previous uplifts have been generally focused on applications of research and aid, which are good things. However, our basic science, which feeds these, has had much less attention. What can the community do to support building the cases for an uplift in science funding? And what conversations with the research councils and UKSA could take place to facilitate this? So sort of linked to our previous point, but, but more about the action that could be taken. Okay, I mean, I can tell you where we are. I mean, I think certainly with STFC, and I've said this at RAS meetings before, our, our number one priority um, for a spending review is an uplift in our, I can't, I can't remember what we call it, but basically uplift in the core programme. I mean, I think we all recognise this problem. This message is coming out of all of the research councils. So STFC is not alone in that. So I, I believe that um, UKRI as a whole will make a case for an uplift in that, that basic, basic research programme. Um, because everything that follows on that, all of the innovation technology development, you need that basic research programme to underpin that. Um, I, I'm not sure if there's anything additional the community can actually do. I think, I think that case is being made very strongly and I think it will be a significant part of, significant, significant focus of the um, uh, UKRI submission to the spending review. Okay. Okay, thank you, Mark. Um, Graham, did you want to add anything or are you happy with? No, that's fine. I think Mark said it very well. Okay, perfect. Thank you. So um, a slightly different question now, um, again, um, to UKRI really, but could, could you possibly comment on the UKRI open access policy and the new Plan S rights retention strategy? I was hoping somebody wasn't going to ask me that question. And I, <laughs> I tried to online get advice when I saw that question coming up. So, so that's one I'd, I'd rather respond to offline, actually, so I give you, a, give you a correct answer rather than something imprecise. That's absolutely fine. Um, OK, I've got some fairly consolidated grant-related questions. I'm just scanning through to see if we have anything more general. 
just bear with me a second. Um, Okay, here's an interesting one. So what are the implications of increasing private space projects or space tourism for ensuring that we take global responsibility for the impact of our explorations of the universe? Okay, that's... that's maybe, maybe I can uh, start <laughs> off that. Um, I think it's linking back also to the constellation, to the mega constellation question. <laughs> and I would like to also use that opportunity to mention that it's also the Royal Astronomy Society and the European Astronomy Society that are actually in close watch uh, of that problem. I think ultimately the, the biggest problem that we have is this uh, space junk, the space debris problem which is exponentially rising and uh, there is a danger of that getting untenable in the next 10-15 um, years if we don't do something dramatic about it. So I believe we need to come up with clear rules that whoever brings something up also brings uh, something down so that we don't increase the number of um, space uh, debris objects out there. And also there are some clear um, motions towards active debris removal. <laughs> Uh, where ESA is also engaged now in bringing down at least some parts uh, of um, what we have left out there. So I, I believe in general space tourism uh, is not a bad thing because it is in principle amplifying possibilities and, and push uh, towards space, but we have to do it in, in a clear consensual, um, I mean, economic, uh, ecological uh, co uh, consensual um, motion. Yeah. Thank you, Gunther. Would anybody else like to contribute? No. Okay, so I've got a, a few questions aimed at you, Mark. I hope that's okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, so the first one is, is the current situation with China likely to compromise our aspirations to be a global player? Um, I think it's probably a difficult, difficult question to answer at this stage. I mean, the, the current position, um, current official position is you know we, we, we want to engage with China on science um, now whether that will change or not I, I, I don't know but the, you know the scientific engagement with a you know a clear scientific power like uh, China is, is, is something that we, we still want to do now whether that will change in in future with government you know foreign and common uh, wealth office advice I, I honestly don't know it's a little little bit early to answer that question. Okay. And maybe from, from, from the ESA point of view, can I say a word? Uh, we uh, China is clearly one of the strategic partners of ESA. It, that has been decided by the ESA Council uh, some years ago. And we have uh, several projects with them. Uh, Graham has mentioned SMILE, which is a 50-50 project between ESA and China. And we are very, uh, very interested in getting that through. Uh, we are facing some headwinds regarding the export uh, control issues, which are getting more and more difficult. So we are we have to resort to um, basically license-free um, uh, export control um, uh, products. But we are really determined to um, develop, continue to, to develop China as a partner. Yeah. Thank you, Günther. Okay, so if we could switch now to there's a few consolidated grant questions as I'm sure you anticipated Mark so I'm just going to see if I can run some past you in the in the remaining few minutes. So, first of all, when is STFC expected to make a decision on the future of the consolidated grant scheme, um, which you mentioned in your presentation. Yeah, so my, my understanding is, I mean, the, the, the implementation plan is being uh, discussed by Jim and that committee at the moment. Um, it clearly won't be implemented immediately. I, I, I did quickly offline get a check on a date. So, so, it, so if there is a change, we'd expect that to come in in 2021. Okay. Um, and there's a question about, are there any written documents available with regard to that review? Um, that um, reviewed? I couldn't tell you offhand again, but it, it, it is being run through the community. So it's a community driven view. Um, so, so part of this was reviewing the overall consolidated grants uh, and the effectiveness of that for not just astronomy, but for particle physics. And of course they're different. There, there are differences in the two. That came out in the review. I think that that's what led us to, to wanting to look at this kind of mixed model of these larger real consolidated grants for astronomy. 
and more standard grants, because in, in practice, that's almost what's happening at the moment, where it's that kind of mixture. Uh, so we're really looking for that, that the, the implementation plan to be, to be developed. We don't think there are, I mean, I saw another, there was another question about overheads, uh, administrative overheads. We, we don't think there are any significant administrative overheads in this. I hope that gives people rough, you know, an idea of what the time, the time, time scale is. And, and uh, as I say, colleagues of mine would have to get back to you if you wanted to uh, know about written documentation. In the fullness of time. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Mark. Um, so the, another related point is that there's continuing erosion of academic FEC in the STFC consolidated grants due to flat cash. Um, and that's having a corrosive effect in the universities in terms of recruitment and promotion for individuals. How can we mitigate against this? Big question. It's a very, it's a very big question, a very challenging one. Um, it's not only STFC that faced this challenge, I mean, other councils face this challenge as well. Um, and what our grants panels have been doing in the last few years have been protect, protecting postdoc positions. And to do that uh, in, a, in a falling budget, they've been reducing FEC. And, uh, and I, I agree, it's a far from ideal situation. Uh, mm -hmm. you know, there, are, there are two solutions. One of, one of them is unpalatable, which is to change that balance. Um, I'm not sure any of us would be comfortable in that. It clearly reduces scientific exploitation. Or well, the other one is more money. And um, we'll, we'll see what happens in the spending review. I, I would, I mean, it's, F F the FEC system at the moment is clearly not, let's say, not functioning as uh, originally planned, perhaps. It's under a lot, it's under a lot of pressure. So uh, there are, there's, there's no good answer to that without more money. And I, I think we all recognise there is a problem. Yes, it's interesting to hear that. And I think, you know, obviously it has been challenging over the last few years. And now with the COVID-19 crisis, that is, is more sharply felt at the university level. And I think, you know, that will be challenging in the next year or so for, for researchers coming through that system. So, yeah, on that point, my, my, I mean, my personal view, and this is a pers personal view, is you know, the COVID-19 COVID will shine a light on FEC across, across UKRI impact. Yeah. Um, that's, a, that's a personal view, but yes, the particular challenges the university sector are undergoing at the moment. Um, yes, I, think, I, I suspect we will look, look, look yet again at FEC, uh, but it, ultimately it's a question of money. Absolutely. Um, so I'm just going to ask one final question um, on the, um, can you recommend the best funding avenues for astronomy research, which has a significant interdisciplinary or knowledge transfer component, especially for early career researchers? That's a very good, it's a very good question. Um, so previously we had, um, SDFC had a, an R&D fund, a rather low level R&D fund, project research and development fund, which was open to all, which could be a range of small, small grants. And this was really, really early, relatively early stage technology development. Uh, we're, we're currently undergoing, we don't have that scheme at the moment, it's been squeezed out by other pressures, but we, we've, we've actually had a review on whether, whether it's desirable to re reintroduce a scheme like that. Mm. Um, now, in a broader UKRI picture, I think one of the things we're looking, looking at doing is putting together, a, look, looking at where the gaps are in that whole um, technology development, technology transfer process are, because I think there are there are gaps at the moment. Um, so I think there's there are a number of initiatives going on, uh, which could could address this this gap. And I, I think whoever asked the question, I think kind of noticed that there is a gap there at the moment. I mean there are there are schemes, um, but none of none of them I would say are ideal at the moment. I, I was personally you know personally a big big fan of the Project R and D program because it gave people a chance to to develop early early stage technology. I was, I was actually a beneficiary of it myself, actually, a lot, many, many years ago. Um, but it's again, again, it's, it's money. Yeah. But maybe just a, a motherhood statement. Sorry, Emma, that I interrupt. Yeah, but yeah. I think astronomy belongs to some of the most interdisciplinary sciences uh, of all. So I think we have to push this um, very strongly. Yeah, and I think that the Future Leaders Fellowships sort of really speak to this, actually, as a, an opportunity. But again, it's that you already have to have a certain level of leadership. So again, it comes back to that earlier question about bridging that gap for the very early career 
researchers working in that area of technology development to really have the opportunities to to gain funding so yeah i think that all of these things sort of you know they're parallel to each other some of these questions that have come up this morning okay i'm going to hand over to robert in just a second but i would just like to thank all of you Graham, Gunther and Mark, thank you so much for joining us this morning. Um, it's been so useful, great to hear your presentations and thank you for engaging in, in the question and answer session. So thank, uh, thank you too. <laughs> and I'll pass over to Robert to, to wind us up. Thank you. Thank you too. Thanks Emma. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Thank you, Emma, and thank you to all our panellists for joining today. I thought that was a fantastic uh, session and uh, we've had some nice positive feedback on Twitter, which is very generous because we're still finding our feet with this to some extent. Um, you know, in closing this, um, you know, we will put the a recording of the session on YouTube so that if you weren't able to connect for all of it or, you know, you know, people who, who had other things to do this morning, they can, they can watch it later on. Um, obviously, we'll keep an eye on Twitter as well to see if any other any other things come up and pass those on to panellists if needs be. Uh, and uh, other than that, I think it would be great to uh, let you know as well that we are running things despite lockdown. We're still carrying on uh, offering sessions, we're running public lectures, we have a big schools program if anybody's looking for uh, things to uh, do with their children over the summer, a while, and, you know, obviously schools have been closed for quite a long time now in the UK. So, um, you know, other than that, thank you so much for your ongoing support with the society, we very much appreciate it and so many people are able to attend this today. And uh, we look forward to seeing you face to face soon and certainly hopefully, hopefully in Bath next year for our uh, postponed bicentenary now. Thank you. <laughs>